Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody is keeping safe, maintaining uh, social distancing at home. Uh, it's important that uh, you follow these instructions for uh, this is the only protection we have against the COVID-19 coronavirus. So with that introduction, let me get to what I'm going to present today. Uh, I'm going to be largely talking about the technology and the uh, the hardware which uh, makes the detection of uh, uh, gravitational waves possible. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is uh, LIGO Detector Technology. And I will also spend some time talking about uh, research opportunities and training opportunities that students may have uh, if you were to, uh, if you were interested in joining this area. Now, uh, most people uh, have seen uh, gravitational wave simulations or uh, depictions of it, where you have two coalescing uh, black holes and uh, they the space uh, is represented as a, uh, as a surface of uh, water where you have rippling of uh, waves which are traveling away from the, uh, the coalescing binaries. Now, this is a very uh, common uh, representation of uh, gravitational waves. Uh, however, of course, uh, space is not two-dimensional, as we all know, so it is not really uh, uh, the reality. Uh, it is a representation, a two-dimensional representation of what uh, we would like to imagine as gravitational waves. So I have a, uh, another simulation. Uh, let me see if I can get to that. Uh, so uh, this is a, a once again a coalescing uh, binary black holes. However, this time you will see that the simulation is in three dimensions, and you will see the waves which are propagated away from the coalescing binary black holes. Uh, what I would like you to notice is uh, that uh, in different directions of uh, propagation the nature of the gravitational wave distortion of space is different. Uh, so let me start this. Initially, we have the black holes in what we call the in-spiral phase. We are moving out, zooming out. So that, and you notice these uh, little gray circles on the uh, edge of the uh, simulation. Uh, the nature of the gravitational wave as it passes a, a deformable body, like let us say these are some kind of flexible uh, spherical bodies. And uh, the, as the gravitational wave passes by, this flexible body stretches and compresses because, of, because it is following the uh, compression and stretching of space. Uh, now, the horizontal plane is the plane where the orbital, where the two holes, two black holes are orbiting each other. And the vertical plane you see is perpendicular to the plane of the orbitals, of the orbits. Uh, so let's proceed. As the uh, black holes approach each other, the waves are propagating outwards. And notice that the little gray circle on the top is actually slowly rotating, whereas the one which is on the equatorial plane is oscillating. So this is the nature of the gravitational wave that the, in, the, in the plane of the orbits, the, the nature of stretching and compression of space makes the circle oscillate into an ellipse, whereas perpendicular to the uh, propagation of the uh, perpendicular to the orbital plane, the uh, uh, the ellipse, which is on top here, will begin to rotate in addition to also becoming a stretched ellipse. So depending on which direction you are, how the source is oriented towards you, uh, the, the nature of the uh, stretching and compression of space is different in different directions. This is something one has to keep in mind uh, when you try to reconstruct the source by observing the uh, the detected signal that you get in your detector. 
Um, all of this goes into the search algorithms that uh, Sanjit spoke to you a few days ago and uh, in reconstructing the nature of the source. However, for us, it is important to keep this in mind because it has some implications for what we are trying to detect. Now, as we proceed uh, to, as the black holes approach each other, they, they distort each other, they, they undergo tidal deformations. And uh, in the very end, there is a, a coalescence and then you have a single black hole. And a single black hole being an extremely symmetric object does not radiate any gravitational waves after, after it stops ringing. Here is the tidal distortion of the, of the two black holes. And then they're zooming out because here the, the spatial uh, distortion is very great. You can see the ellipse here is oscillating very strongly and the ellipse here is rotating. In between, you have a, both a stretching and rotation. And that's the end of the simulation. Uh, now, as I said, if you consider uh, there's the natural spatial distortion uh, in the plane of the orbits, uh, you have a, a you have a uh, you have a circle. Let us say there are uh, masses which are suspended along the edges of the circle. Uh, when the gravitational wave passes by, the circle the circular shape in, in which you have placed your masses is going to get distorted, and uh, the masses are going to move following the circle, and uh, they would get distorted into an ellipse. So a mass which is up here would move in closer, whereas a mass over here will move outwards. Now this is a perfect uh, system, which is uh, ideal for detecting such a distortion of space. And we call this the Michelson interferometer. The Michelson interferometer has, uh, okay, I'll come to how exactly it works in my next slide or so. I think it's first important to uh, get a grasp of uh, how small is this displacement of this object and this object when the gravitational wave passes by. So consider, for example, uh, two sun-like stars which have collapsed to form black holes or some other very compact objects like neutron stars. And they are about 1.4 solar masses, which is the limit beyond which you can Form black holes. It's called the Chandrasekhar limit uh, after our own Indian uh, astrophysicist. Uh, such a source, like two of six such uh, 1.4 solar mass black holes, are at a distance of nearly the Virgo cluster. Virgo cluster is a cluster of galaxies at a distance of about 15 megaparsecs, far away from our galaxy. At such a distance, if these two were to coalesce, and they, they are having an orbit around each other of uh, uh, about 20 kilometers and the orbital frequency is about 400 hertz. That means they're spinning, they're going around each other 400 times a second. Uh, then the amount of spatial distortion we expect uh, is uh, about 10 to the minus 21. Now, what is this number 10 to the minus 21? It is uh, this fraction. Uh, it is the delta L, which is the amount of shift the change in the length of this particular distance between this object called the PS and this object called the EMY. Uh, let us say this EMY shifted closer by an amount of delta L. This total length of this distance between the PS and EMY is L. It is a ratio of delta L over L. That means it is a relative change in the distance between two objects, such two suspended objects. That is what we call uh, strain because it has the dimension with unit, just like strain, delta L over L. And uh, this quantity is what we try to detect. We, we, we characterize it in this fashion because a gravitational wave actually causes a strain in space. That means for small L, the delta L is small for a given H. The H is given to us by this particular expression. So this is the amount of gravitational wave strain that is caused by a typical object like this. And uh, given this much amount of strain, if you wanted to actually observe a physical displacement of a mirror, then, you know, 
you need to have so the actual delta l is going to be h times l this uh, denominator so if you wanted to increase delta l you need a very large l and that is the reason why our interferometers are very big this length between bs and emy is 4 kilometers and uh, yeah so the entire game is in detecting how how we can manage this extraordinarily small number like suppose let us say we had an l of a thousand meters then you would have 10 to the minus 21 multiplied by 10 to the 3 then you would get 10 to the minus 18 meters now 10 to the minus 8 so one kilometer long uh distance if you had two objects and you if you could observe the change in the distance between these two objects uh, you would still have to observe something smaller than the diameter of a proton. That is the amount by which this EMY would shift and EMX would shift. Uh, this is the challenge which uh, gravitational wave detection poses for us, to detect changes in the length, changes in the distance between objects which are separated by a kilometer and you need to ch look at the distance change down to the fraction of a proton's diameter. So let's see how that is done. Uh, now, a Michelson interferometer is how we detect these gravitational waves, and the principle of how this works is what I'm going to explain to you now. Uh, and subsequently, on the left, on the right-hand panel here, we will actually display what was this detected in the first detection of gravitational waves. So, let me start this animation. Here we have. Before I start, I'll explain the parts. We have a laser source here. There is a beam splitter. The beam splitter splits the laser beam into two pathways. One goes to this mirror on the left, another goes to this mirror on the right. Both of them retro reflect the light exactly in backwards in the path in which it arrived. The two beams would arrive here. They would then split again, and some of it would reach our detector, which is a square object here. So let's see what happens. So you have a laser beam that goes, splits, comes back and recombines and forms now. As you know, light is a, uh, a wave and uh, waves can combine uh, constructively or destructively depending on the relative phase between two waves. So in principle, though light is reflected into this path from both the mirrors, you can adjust the length of the arms such that the light in this path cancels each other and there is actually no light unless the length of these arms is disturbed by a passing gravitational wave. So let's see what happens. If I were to, oops, we start the animation. Yes, the light splits, comes back and recombines. Now, if there's a shake, then you see that the light in this pathway fluctuates. Why exactly does this happen? We have a wave that splits. It's a wave with a phase and an amplitude. Now when it hits a mirror, the phase flips and it proceeds backwards. This also comes back here and the two beams pass through the beam splitter again and create a destructive interference. You see one wave is actually opposite in phase to the other and one cancels the other. The troughs and the peaks cancel each other. Uh, this is a normal condition of the interferometer. But when a passing gravitational wave comes by, it can actually disturb the interferometer. And it can create constructive and destructive interference here. There you go. That is a constructive, destructive. So in this pathway, the light can begin to change in amplitude if the mirrors were to move. The constructive and destructive interference is how we, uh, that is the reason why we call it an interferometer. Uh, this is the, a simple uh, version of how a Michelson interferometer works. This simple device, though it's perfectly suited for us, uh, needs to be enhanced in its sensitivity significantly before we can observe actually gravitational waves. So let me now see, show you how it, uh, the signal looks like, what if you were to manage how to do that. Now, I don't know if you can.
So the nature of the sound, not actually sound, the nature of the uh, distortion of space, as the black holes approach each other, you might have seen in the simulation that they speed up. So the frequency of the gravitational wave goes up as the time passes. And here in this plot, what you have here in the y-axis is the frequency. On the x-axis is time. And as time passes, you will see that initially, you can see a little vision. So that is the nature of the uh, uh, of the chirp. It's called a chirp because it sounds like a chirping of a bird. Uh, of course, you know that space actually doesn't carry sound. We have actually converted the electrical signal into a sound, and that's how we are able to hear it. Uh, let's uh, now look at uh, you know this is how one detector would uh, detect a gravitational wave. But you can see here that there were actually two, LIGO at Hanford and LIGO at Livingston. Uh, we need two of them uh, in order to be able to locate the source in the sky. I'll come to how exactly that is done a bit later if you're interested. Uh, there are many detectors now currently operational. Uh, we have LIGO Hanford, LIGO Livingston, which are both in the US. They are across uh, the United States diagonally. One is in the northwest near Seattle. One is in the southeast near uh, New Orleans. Uh, the names Hanford and Livingston are the nearest towns to the detectors. Uh, then there is one called Geo 600, which is a German English collaboration, uh, which operates uh, in Hanover in Germany. And then there is Virgo, which is uh, an Italian. Uh, French collaboration, and also it includes other nations like Netherlands and France and uh, several other countries in Europe. I think there are eight countries or so which uh, form the Virgo collaboration. Uh, presently, Kagura, which is the Japanese underground detector, is just about coming up. They will soon be operational. LIGO India is a proposed detector which we aim to build. Uh, and he, and uh, the current plan is to get it operational by 2025 or 2026. I will tell you a little bit about LIGO India towards the end of my talk. So the idea is to construct a network of such detectors and operate them as a global network, like a like a radio telescope array, because each detector is actually not a not like a telescope. It's more like an antenna, like a radio antenna. It's like a not a dipole antenna, but a quadru quadrupole antenna, because gravitational waves are quadrupolar in nature, not dipolar like electron electromagnetic waves. Now, let me tell you a little bit about LIGO detectors and how they work. This is a, a simplified optical layout of the advanced LIGO detectors. The reason it's called advanced LIGO is because there was a previous generation of LIGO detectors in the same sites called the initial LIGO detectors and enhanced LIGO detectors. They successively had better and better sensitivities. And advanced LIGO was an upgrade. Uh, so we have uh, essentially a, a second generation of detectors, uh, which are currently operational. Uh, the advanced LIGO detector has, uh, you can see, uh, it has roughly the shape of the Michelson. It's kind of hidden. You can see the BS, which is the beam splitter here. Uh, on, on the far left, there is a laser. And then you have ETM which is the end test mass. Uh, and then here we have another EGM, which is another end test mass. And then we have something called an ITM, which is the input test mass. Uh, there are two input test masses. So uh, the, the sensitivity of the detector is significantly increased. If we, as you know, we have to increase the effective length of the arm. Uh, the distance between the ITM and the ETM is, is four kilometers. Uh, these uh, mirrors are about uh, 40 centimeters in diameter, uh, and they weigh about uh, 35, 40 kilograms or so. Uh, the reason why we have two mirrors in each arm is because if you can take the light and make it bounce back and forth between these two mirrors, it's like the four kilometers has been traversed many times by light. And it is, its effective length gets increased by the number of times the light travels back and forth between these two 
Typically, in our case, it can travel back and forth by 100 times. So the four kilometers essentially looks like an effective arm of 400 kilometers. Uh, that's how we get a better sensitivity in these colors. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the laser, and then you have these triangular object here. Uh, that, that is, the light beams are made to go in a triangular optical cavity. Uh, these optical cavities are like resonators, and they are capable of enhancing the amount of light power that they can uh, uh, trap inside. And uh, this particular input mode cleaner, uh, its job is to uh, clean the kind of uh, light that laser generates. Laser generates uh, a lot of laser noise. And uh, the mode cleaner helps us to clean that light and make it a very pure light. Uh, this uh, very pure, what we call the transverse electric mode 00, TEM00 light, is allowed to pass through into the main interferometer. By the time it uh, actually enters the interferometer, the laser light has been amplified by a series of cavities uh, and uh, uh, amplifiers. Uh, and these, this light reaches a, a power of about 125 watts. Uh, this, this light is uh, incident on the beam splitter and it splits and comes back. But uh, as you know, towards this direction, the direction in which uh, you know, there are four directions here. In two, one direction, there is a laser. Two directions, there are arms. And then there's a fourth direction. This direction is where we keep the detector. This is the detector. It's called photodiode. So it's called a PD here. Uh, so the light that goes in this pathway is uh, actually undergoing destructive interference. So there is no light here. Of course, energy has to be conserved. So when all the light is incident on the beam splitter and nothing is going out in this pathway, we will then expect that most of the light, it, well, it cannot escape from these mirrors because they're nearly 100% reflectivity. So most of the light just comes back to you. So all that light is actually coming back towards the laser and we don't want it to get back into the laser. So we put in here what is called a Faraday isolator, FI. The job of the Faraday isolator is to uh, redirect the light that comes, returns from the interferometer back towards the laser and then dump it safely. But then if you just dump the light which was returning to you, it is in some sense wasted because the signal here is actually proportional to the amount of light you can trap in these arms. And the more light you can trap, the more sensitive your signal, your interferometer becomes, becomes and you can uh, enhance the amount of light fluctuation that you will get for a given amount of mirror motion. And in order to do that, what we do is we take this returning light and we put another mirror here called the power recycling mirror and we push that light back into the interferometer. So this in, in effect, the light that is reflected from the arms towards the laser is pushed back into the interferometer by the power recycling mirror. This forms once again, an optical cavity, we call that a power recycling cavity. The power recycling cavity has a gain of about 40 or so. So this 125 watts is enhanced to something like 5.2 kilowatts in the power recycling cavity. Then this 5.2 kilowatts is incident on the arms and the arms have a gain factor of another 200 or so. So this 5.2 kilowatts then becomes seven and a half, 7.5 kilowatts. It's almost three quarters of a megawatt of power that is trapped inside these arms. Uh, and any small fluctuation here would mean that the amount of light that is returning towards the dark port will fluctuate because a small fraction of the 750 kilowatts is going to leak out in this direction and not exactly cancel out the 750 watts coming back from here. Uh, so the, the unbalance in these arms is what's going to create a signal here. When the light passes out of uh, the interferometer here towards the detector, uh, we would like to uh, enhance certain part of the frequency domain in which we expect the gravitational wave signals to be. In our case, this frequency domain is about 50 hertz to about two kilohertz. And in that domain, we want to amplify the light. 
so we put what is called a signal recycling mirror and we amplify the light that is returning towards us we push that light back into the interferometer and we extract uh, just that particular frequency band that is of interest to us that's that's the role of the mirror here called the signal recycling mirror after the light leaves the signal recycling mirror we have another faraday isolator uh, which once again does the same thing we don't want light returning back from this path to enter into the interferometer so, and then we have an instrument which is called an output mode cleaner which is quite similar to an input mode cleaner and after it cleans the light that is returning from the interferometer we detect only that particular channel which contains the gravitational wave signal uh, i went a little fast here but we can come back to any of the questions you have in the operation of the optical plant of the interferometer later so uh, i'm now going to talk about uh, various parts of the interferometer and explain to you how it works then we are going to spend a little bit of time trying to understand how the performance of the interferometer can be improved for future interferometers as well as the present interferometer how it can how its performance can be improved and then uh, i will explain to you how one of uh, any of you who are interested could join this adventure now in order to grasp the full uh, interferometer uh, uh, operational complexity we divide the interferometer into uh, different uh, zones zones of interest so all the optics and all the parts which form the basic michelson interferometer we call this uh, you know fabry ferro michelson interferometer because it has fabry ferro arms and then it is power recycled and signal recycled so we call it a dual recycled fabry ferro michelson interferometer it's a long name but it kind of captures all the various parts in the optical plant so there is a bunch of people who concern themselves with the optical plant and how to how to build it and how to manage it there is a bunch of people who worry about how to do the laser how to produce a very powerful very clean laser that that we require we operate at uh, 1064 nanometers 1064 nanometers wavelength of light uh, it's a kind of near infrared uh, then we have input optics and output optics so there are a bunch of people who take care of the input and output optics uh there are a bunch of people who take care of the entire control system where we have computers which uh, observe the sensor signals coming from various parts of the interferometer and then you feed back into the interferometer to hold it in a certain configuration that you want uh then you have a bunch of people who are worried about how exactly to keep the mirrors very very quiet how to protect it from ground motion how to protect it from uh, atmospheric disturbances um uh, and so on so then this is a very advanced field where we try to uh, figure out how exactly we can quieten a certain kind of phase noise that we have in the detector so we have various sections of the interferometer uh, uh here i have uh, uh <clears throat> mentioned what we call subsystems there is a core optic subsystem which worries about all the various optics and how to get them ready these are some of the these exquisite optics are some of the world's best and it's not easy to make them so one has to be very careful about how they are machined how they are polished uh it's a, a specialized field in itself i will just in a, in a next few slides i will show you how good these optics are uh then we have a seismic isolation we have once again uh, as i said the mirror displacement has to be of the order of uh, to the minus 18 for us to be able to see it tend to the minus 18 meters uh that means the ground shake should not shake the mirror ground shakes all the time because of seismic activity or vehicular activity people activity factories and trains and everything shakes the ground and uh if we want uh, the mirrors to not shake you have to protect the mirrors from the ground motion Uh, so that's called seismic isolation and suspension design you know, these two uh, bodies uh, of people the people who work in these two sub, uh, sub uh, divisions of the ligo uh, worry about uh, how to reduce the mirror motion let me see if there are any questions coming up not yet uh okay then you have uh, 
you know, we have, as I said, uh, nearly a megawatt of light trapped inside these cavities. And if uh, even a very small fraction of this light is absorbed uh, by the mirrors, the mirrors will get hot and uh, a hot mirror changes shape. And once the mirror changes shape, uh, the interferometer will no longer work. So we have a thermal compensation system in place, which compensates for the change in the curvature of the mirror as we increase the power in the interferometer. Um, these very long arms uh, need to be brought into resonance with the laser light. That means the initial motion of these arms has to be less than a nanometer, the fluctuation in the arms. So bringing the laser, uh, bringing the arms and making them quiet requires an initial stabilization system called, called the arm length stabilization. Then there is output optics and input optics. These are all subsystems that people work in. Now, so far I've mentioned uh, specific subsystems which are concerned with what we call kind of local problems, local to an, an test mass or local to a beam splitter. Then we have these kind of global control problems. We have to control the length of a four kilometer arm and bring it very close to the length of another four kilometer arm. Uh, so this kind of very uh, extended control is called global control in LIGO. And we have three, three subsystems which worry about how to maintain the entire interferometer, which is a huge object, to be in an operational state. This is called length sensing and control, angle sensing and control, and physical environmental monitoring. So these are like this, there are multiple subsystems and people kind of divide their work among these various subsystems. Now, what exactly is, uh, what is it that we are worried about? As I, I mentioned a few of these problems in terms of what are the things which disturb an interferometer. I mentioned the seismic vibrations which can shake a suspended mirror. Then uh, these uh, mirrors are inside vacuum, obviously, because uh, a light beam passing through air would be disturbed by the uh, random fluctuations in the density of air, which would cause uh, uh, refractive index variations, which would mean that the speed of light through air would change. Now, what we are trying to detect here is in some sense a delay time because you have a light beam which starts off here in, in two directions. And we're trying to detect how much time it takes to come back. Now, if this mirror had moved away and this mirror had moved towards us, the, this, this particular arm would return the light a little bit sooner than this, this arm. And so in some sense, we have got two delay lines and anything that delays the propagation of light in these two arms will also cause a signal which is similar to a gravitational wave and therefore, we consider it as noise because it's not a real gravitational wave. It has occurred because of some kind of a phase delay that has occurred in the past. Uh, when the light beams recombine here, you have light which is incident on a photodetector. Now light, as we know, has a dual nature. It has both uh, particulate and wave-like nature. The particulate nature of light causes a kind of noise because uh, because anything that you count and which is arriving at random times has what we call a Poisson noise. It's a, just a statistical noise of counting. And uh, this kind of noise is uh, fundamental to nature. And we experience the same kind of noise in LIGO and we call it short noise because it comes as like uh, pellets, like shots. Uh, so at the moment we have uh, ways to reduce the short noise using what we call a squeeze light source, but uh, it's a very specialized field. This is one of the major contributing noise sources at this time to LIGO in the high frequency domain. Also in the low frequency domain in, in a different way. Uh, we have laser itself. The laser produces frequency noise, intensity noise, and phase fluctuations. So we have to handle the laser and feed back to the laser to control its uh, noise. So we have intensity feedback loops, we have frequency control loops, and we also have a phase feedback loop. Uh, these, uh, the photon fluctuation, photon number fluctuations, which is the same thing as a short noise, when the amount of photons trapped inside these arms fluctuate, they will actually kick the arms and create 
uh, length fluctuations in the halves. That's called radiation pressure noise. Uh, that's also a, a noise source which is linked to the photon shot noise. Uh, however, it is processed by the optical plant and therefore it contributes at low frequencies. Uh, then you have inherent noise of the thermal fluctuations within the mirrors. And uh, especially right now, we have a serious problem with the thermal fluctuations in the coatings of the mirrors. So the way we understand this uh, uh, limitations of uh, sensitivity to the detector is depicted in a kind of a plot where you have, uh, uh, you know, you take that signal which is coming out to the photodiode and you do a Fourier transform on it and you display a spectrum. The spectrum is what is plotted here, the spectrum of the uh, photodiode signal, uh, which has been calibrated on the to show you uh, what is the displacement of the mirrors, and then divided by the length of the distance between the mirrors gives you the strain. So what is plotted in the y-axis is actually the fluctuations of the mirrors, uh, you know, parametrized in a certain way. So uh, this is the noise uh, which uh, the, the the detection noise that you have in the uh, detected signal in the photodiode. We are taking a spectrum of it. The spectrum is going from roughly uh, two, three hertz to a few kilohertz. And you can see here the black curve is what's called the total noise curve. That is the present limit to our sensitivity. And we want to do better than this. Uh, what is stopping us from doing it? The, the total noise curve is a sum of various noise sources which I just now mentioned to you. For example, the brown curve is a seismic noise curve. That is what that one is over here. We have suppressed the seismic noise very effectively so that it does not contribute in what we call the detection band. The detection band is a band of frequencies where we have adequate sensitivity. In our case, for example, you can say it is something like below 10 to the minus 22. Uh, below 20 to the minus 22 here means it starts at about, say, 10 hertz, a little worse, maybe uh, 20, 30 hertz here. Uh, and then it goes all the way to a few kilohertz. Right? So that is our detection band. Uh, any noise source that contributes within the detector, detection band is a serious problem for us. Uh, let me watch the time. I have 20 minutes more. Uh, we have uh, excess gas noise, which has been suppressed very effectively. Uh, we have uh, substrate Brownian motion, thermal noise of the substrate that's also suppressed very effectively. But you take this thing called the coating Brownian noise. That is a thermal noise in the coatings. And that is a dominant noise source below which you cannot go. You cannot push the black curve below the red curve because the red curve is the dominant contributor in this domain. But in another frequency domain, another Another source can be dominant. For example, the, the photon fluctuation noise, which is now called the quantum noise here, because it comes from the quantum nature of light. Uh, it is dominant at both low frequencies as well as high frequencies. So it is a serious uh, limitation for us. Uh, but uh, coating term Brownian noise, we expect we can do better coatings, whereas quantum noise is a fundamental limit and it's not so easy to get past a fundamental limit. I'll come back to how exactly we keep the laser in sync with the uh, cavities, the optical cavities. We use a technique called the pound river hall technique. If someone is interested in the details, I can come back to it later. I have to speed up a little bit. The pre-stabilized laser, as I was saying, is an exquisite object. It's been designed and built in Germany, and uh, it was then Germany uh, is also a, uh, a part of the LIGO collaboration. Uh, and so they contributed the, uh, what they call the pre-stabilized laser. It has several stages. It has an initial uh, seed laser, and then it is amplified in a couple of stages. Uh, the optics, as I said, are uh, the world's best. We are the only customer for these optics because nobody wants optics this good. Uh, the optical surfaces here, are uh, better than, like if you were to ask what is the difference of this optic from the ideal surface from one end to the other, it is less than a nanometer. It's a few atoms of in, in accuracy. 
uh, in terms of uh, what you get in a normal laboratory, typically you would get what we call lambda by 10 or something, which is one tenth of a wavelength of light. These are a lambda by 1000 optics. So they, are, uh, they require very special techniques to build it. Uh, the suspensions are a, uh, have been largely developed in the University of Glasgow and uh, in, uh, in Italy and in uh, Australia, and in MIT. So it's a global group. Uh, we have built various parts of it and they have developed the technology together. The, the core optics of the LIGO are suspended in what we call a quadruple suspension. Uh, these are like one pendula below the other four stages. The reason why we do that is clear in the next slide. Uh, when we talk about uh, how much is the ground moving and how much is the mirror moving, we want the mirror to not move even though the ground moves. And that's called a isolation. That is how much is the attenuation that you can get. Uh, here, that is uh, meters by meters. That means if the ground moves by a certain amount of meters, how much does the mirror move? As you can see, this is a frequency dependent answer. When you have a single suspension like this blue curve here, yeah, it has a single resonance, at, uh, like a pendulum has a resonance. At frequencies far above the resonance, the suspended object moves very little. And uh, as you increase the frequency of interest and you go to higher and higher frequencies, you'll notice that the mirror moves lesser and lesser. And uh, the slope of this is one over frequency squared. So if you move from a resonance at one hertz to 100 hertz, the attenuation factor is 100 times 2. So it's 10 to the 4, 10,000 times the attenuation. With every successive stage of the suspension, we can add a 1 more 1 over f square factor. And we have four stages. So we have a 1 over f to the 8 factor. So when you go, when you build a suspension, each of them is roughly 1 hertz. And uh, you ask at a 100 hertz, what is the attenuation that this suspension can provide? It is 100 raised to the power of 8, which is 10 to the 16. So the suppression in the ground motion at the mirror at 100 hertz is 16, 10 to the 16 times. And that is how we suppress the mirror motion in the frequency band of interest. So we have not suppressed the mirror motion at all frequencies, but only in the frequency band of interest. Uh, similarly, we have the seismic isolation system which is once again a kind of a spring mass system in which there are multiple stacks. And uh, it works pretty similar to what the, uh, the suspensions do in principle. But of course, uh, they are uh, functionally, uh, they're kind of a pre-isolator before the suspensions. So suspensions are actually suspended from a seismically isolated platform, which is already very quiet. Uh, in order to achieve a kind of stability in the entire interferometer, we have to do a lot of controls. Uh, we have to do a lot of feedback control. We have to sense the motion and feedback into the system. And the whole thing is controlled by what is called a control and data acquisition system, which is developed within LIGO. Uh, we have, of course, this is not new. We have had control and data acquisition systems in multiple fields, anything from aircraft to cement factories require control and data acquisition systems. But, uh, uh, in the case of LIGO, we have a very specific problem and we have a bunch of sensors which are specific to us and we have a very large area which we, over which our instrument is distributed. So we had to develop our own custom built control system. We have inherited some parts of this technology from other big projects like the Fermi Lab or the Sun, uh, but eventually we all work together as a large collaboration. Uh, so from what I have told you still now, we have what we have uh, is a, a kind of an interface between multiple fields. This is an interdisciplinary field. You have optics on one side, you have mechanics on one side, and you have electronics on the other side. So what happens is everybody, uh, so regardless of in which particular field you have expertise in, uh, you would have to stretch out a little bit into the other domains uh, in order to be able to work uh, in this field, in, in the in area of uh, LIGO detectors. So everybody who has any skill, he has something to contribute. Uh, he will have some interface where he can always uh, find interesting problems and interesting technology. Uh, 
the interferometer uh, is uh, uh, gradually brought up into its operational point, uh, starting from a simple Michelson through the Michael, uh, uh, first uh, having a simple Michelson and then through the uh, Fabry-Bero arms of the Michelson. Then you have a power recycled Michelson and then you have a power and signal recycled Michelson. So this is a, this is a kind of staged uh, uh, build up towards the final configuration. This is typically how uh, we uh, bring the interferometer into an operational state. In order to do that, we have this elaborate length control scheme, which I will not go into just now. Maybe if time permits, we can come back to it later. Uh, the effect of increasing, uh, uh, going from one uh, configuration to the other is to increase the sensitivity of the ejector and increase the, uh, the frequency region over which the interferometer is sensitive. And if you, once you do all that, you have uh, the first pull lock, which means the entire interferometer works. All the parts are in their places and everything is working fine. And this is a photograph from the first time that they achieved the first pull lock in, back in 2015 or so. Soon afterwards was the first detection. Now we have uh, future plans as well beyond that. Uh, we are right now in 2019, 2020 where we have not yet reach, reached, okay, the black curve is the present detector sensitivity, maybe a little better now in 2020. And uh, uh, in uh, uh, the blue curve is what we hope to uh, reach by the year 2022, that is called the detector design sensitivity. That's the best sensitivity that you can get in the advanced LIGO detector as it is built now. Uh, by 2025, we will enhance the performance of the detector by making certain changes. And uh, that interferometer is called the advanced detector, advanced LIGO plus, A plus. So by 2025, the American detectors will be in the A plus configuration. Beyond that, uh, our proposals for increasing the detector sensitivity, we have something called the Voyager proposal, the Einstein telescope and the cosmic explorer. Uh, we can go into the details later, but we hope to achieve uh, by 2035 a detector with a very broad sensitivity over uh, some few tens of hertz to a few kilohertz, but almost uh, 10 times better than what we have now. Now, achieving these future detections, uh, detector sensitivities and future uh, proposals requires development of on almost all facets of technology which currently is operational in LIGO. We have to improve the infrastructure, the core optics, the coatings, cryogenics, simulation control, and you name it, we have to get better at it. And the maturity of these various systems, various subsystems is different in different stages. So depending on, uh, for example, if you take something like uh, 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 infrastructure and facilities, we have a pretty good knowledge of it. So uh, by 2025, we expect to have a good idea of what the Voyager and Cosmic Explorer need. But if you take something like Newtonian noise, we really don't know how to handle that yet. So there are certain technologies which are at a certain level of maturity. Uh, so with this active research multiple in uh, happening in multiple institutions across the globe, uh, the LIGO scientific uh, collaboration and the Virgo collaboration and Kagura and the LIGO India community are all joining hands to work towards this uh, enormous task ahead of us. Uh, all of you are welcome to join and uh, contribute to this activity. So let me tell you how you can join. The basic uh, uh, references of everything I've told you so far are contained in these two papers. One is called the, uh, their publications from the Gravitation Wave International Community. Uh, here are, there are two um, papers which are published uh, not too long ago. The Gwick 10 years on and matters of gravity. Then there is uh, every year we publish what is called an instrument science white paper, which uh, captures all the uh, instrumentation development that happens within the LIGO community. And the instrument science white paper 2019 is the most recent. I think 2020 may be a little delayed, but we will have it out soon. So if anyone is interested in a particular aspect of the instrument and what is happening in the world in this this is like a review paper. It captures everything that's happening globally within the community. So that's a good place to start if you are curious about 
where you where you yourself and your skill set fits into this now coming to ligo india we have uh, uh, four institutions in ligo india uh, we have uh, rrcat uh, which is in indore we have ayuka in pune and we have uh, dcscm which is a division of the department of atomic energy which is uh, uh, tasked with building the site and uh, managing the facility uh, and then we have ipr which uh, is a special institute for plasma research in uh, gandhinagar uh, it is uh, chiefly responsible for the vacuum system the electronics and the local controls rrcat is doing uh, seismic isolation suspensions laser sun optics global control and commissioning ayuka is largely concerning itself with computation and data analysis operations and maintenance training and r and d for detector commission and because of this last feature because anyone who wants to join the into or join the community uh, would uh, ideally interface with ayuka because that is the first step towards uh, uh, learning the technology and obtaining the training that you need to join this community we envisage a kind of training program which goes through four stages initially we just concentrate on the physics of the interferometers without worrying about actually the ligo technology that is the ligo specific software and the ligo specific tools you don't need to worry about that the physics of the interferometer is basic physics and uh, basic physics of light physics of fabricator of cavities uh, physics of lasers all of that is available in multiple laboratories so one can go to many many different kinds of physics laboratories and learn that basic concepts then you if you want to go further uh, this is at the typically at the undergrad level bsc msc btech and tech kind of uh, places uh, then if you want to go beyond that we would encourage you to consider a graduate program uh, that is like a phd and uh, come to one of the nodal institutions where you have the necessary ligo technology in order to train yourself on and then uh, once you join the program as uh, a Uh, a long term uh, participant you would be encouraged to go to one of the uh, uh, prototypes there are many prototypes which are not the full scale interferometer but they are functional interferometers at the level of 10 meters or 40 meters length and they are very good training grounds for understanding how the whole interfer the big interferometers work and they are a kind of a midway point in both in complexity and difficulty so it's a good learning ground for uh, students who want to uh, ramp up their skills towards the final uh, the big interferometers and uh, Livingston Hanford uh, near Pisa and Kashina in Italy and in Japan uh, all of that training is uh, necessary before or uh, is necessary to be able to contribute uh, to LIGO India uh, which we expect uh, to come up in a few years Uh, so we are at this point uh, uh, rapidly uh, recruiting people recruiting students to be able to uh, support this activity once it is uh, taking off in india uh, towards this end we have put together some packages uh, packages of work uh, these are uh, uh, basically concentrating on something like suspensions seismic isolation uh, lasers uh, locking to fabricator cavities Uh, either a fixed cavity or a suspended cavity uh, things like this and we plan to deploy these training packages in multiple colleges uh, where whichever college is interested can approach us and we will try to put together a, a kind of a project uh, based uh, uh, we will run it like a club a science club or an astronomy club we could have a ligo club and uh, we would then take up these activities with the help of your local uh, faculty Uh, within your institutions and we would be able to uh, uh, prepare you for the task ahead uh, we can come back to this later we have other projects which are like based on machine learning artificial intelligence because uh, these tasks are so huge that uh, uh, human beings may find it uh, difficult to cope so we want to train machines to be able to do that Uh, we also have a very powerful simulation software which is called finesse there are other simulation packages also within the community which uh, simulate various parts of the detector finesse itself is an optical simulator it simulates the optical plant and uh, 
Uh, we have uh, students who have already joined us. We have uh, laboratories where they are uh, uh, taking up uh, projects. Uh, so these are all programs that are available to students across India. We also have what is called an off-site facility at Aramcat. This is our own uh, 10 meter prototype, which is uh, under construction and it should be operational by the middle to end of next year. So this is another advanced facility, uh, which you would reach after you pass through the first level one, level two training, which is uh, available in many other labs. Uh, there are uh, there's a website in Ayuka where you can apply. This it's called the Research Opportunities for Students. Uh, if you search for Research Opportunities for Students, Ayuka, LIGO, you would get it. Uh, there's also so this particular uh, website has a common application form for all programs that we support. And the common application form is a Google form. You can fill out your details and we will, whenever we screen the, whenever we screen applications, we will go through the collected applications for various projects and uh, write back to you when you have an opportunity to contribute to this project. Uh, some of the, we also serve as a doorway or a pre-screening activity for uh, uh, groups across the world. There's a Caltech LIGO surf program for which we do the pre-screening. We also do uh, we also do placements at the University of Glasgow uh, and for uh, future talent research awards in Australia, and uh, we are supported by uh, a fund from uh, uh, the British Con British uh, government called the Innovative Baba Fund. Uh, so there are multiple avenues where you can find funding as well as uh, research opportunities. Uh, you just have to write to us or go to our website and uh, go through what we have to offer. Uh, so I would like to wrap up uh, by uh, saying uh, what are the various uh, uh, directions in which uh, one uh, typically thinks of in terms of uh, practical experimental work. Um, Ayuka's role is to uh, prepare the manpower for the operations and maintenance phase and as well as the installation and commissioning phase of the interferometer, the LIGO India. Uh, this takes uh, two directions. One is uh, interferometer modeling and detector characterization. This is uh, a largely kind of a data analysis kind of a job, but more on the practical interferometer side. Uh, in order to do this, you have to have an in-depth knowledge of how the detector works. Uh, in uh, research and development, uh, we for the next generation of detectors, we have uh, 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 research and development for uh, all the Voyager, uh, Cosmic Explorer, all of that, and also some of it for A+. Plus. So, uh, because we have to uh, learn how to operate this detector, and that itself requires us to do a certain amount of research in our own laboratories. Uh, all of this uh, is uh, being pursued in multiple institutions in India. Uh, we will try to guide you to uh, the research happening in various parts. So if you're interested, do write to us. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm sure you must have come up with some questions. I'll be happy to take some. Thank you. I have a question from Parth Bhagavat. I read about the power recycling mirror being used in advanced LIGO project. How does this setup amplify the low initial powers to so much great extent that it detects gravitational waves? What is the mechanism? It is a, uh, a very uh, commonly used mechanism which is used in LIGO, which is called a fabri fabri cavity. It's an optical cavity. That is when you have two mirrors, 
which are facing each other and the light enters the space between the mirrors. Then it bounces back and forth by being multiply reflected. And as long as uh, the light is trapped inside the space between the mirrors, the light power increases between the mirrors. Uh, if you uh, go to Fabry Perot in, in Wikipedia, for example, and read uh, what is a Fabry Perot interferometer, uh, you would uh, be able to understand how the power increases in a Fabry Perot. Uh, Another question from Manan Sit. Uh, does the body need to be flexible? Uh, yes, because uh, if it were a stiff body, well, gravitational force is relatively a weak force compared to electromagnetic force. And this is the reason, for example, uh, even though the Earth is pulling you towards the center of the Earth, you don't fall to the center of the Earth because uh, electromagnetic forces uh, repel between atoms. And uh, you have the uh, Pauli's exclusion principle. There are such forces which exclude you from falling towards the earth. So any compressible body uh, should not be so hard that it cannot be compressed. Otherwise, gravitational wave uh, would not be able to compress you. So there's the reason, this is the reason why we actually look at uh, horizontal movement of mirrors which are suspended. So the mirror is actually free to move in the horizontal direction. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see uh, the motion of the mirrors due to gravitational waves. Uh, we have uh, another question from uh, Shriyas. Uh, gravitational waves, do they cause a warp in space-time? If I understand you uh, correctly by what we mean by a warp, if you mean a distortion, yes, it causes a distortion. Uh, does it cause uh, such a great distortion that you can instantly teletransport from one place in the space to another? No, you don't do that. Yeah. I'm waiting for the next question. Julie J uh, asks, uh, why is asymmetry necessary to produce gravitational waves? Well, uh, you need to have some kind of a disturbance uh, in order to produce a wave. For example, uh, in a pond of water, you need to throw a stone in it and uh, some, some disturbance happens. Now, in the case of uh, electromagnetic waves, you have a positive charge and a negative charge. And if you were to interchange the locations of the positive and negative charges, so you would be able to disturb the electric field. But in the case of gravitational forces, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, you don't have a negative mass, you have only a mass. So the only way you can actually change the, electro the gravitational field is to have some kind of an asymmetric distribution of mass, which is rapidly changing in time. Uh, that This is the reason why you cannot produce a dipolar wave. The, the gravitational waves are not dipolar, but quadrupolar. Uh, so you can have a mass distribution, which looks like a dumbbell. And then if you make the dumbbell uh, rotate, then you would have a, a, a disturbance in the gravitational field. Uh, Shobit Ranjan says, uh, uh, I was wondering about the coherence length of LIGO lasers. All light sources are of a finite coherence. Even the best have a coherence of a few hundred meters. How does it work with four kilometers? Well, I think you have to look at your numbers. Even uh, a, a normal helium neon laser has a coherence length of uh, several kilometers. The coherence length is related to uh, the frequency width of the laser line. And uh, as we build better and better lasers with uh, lesser and lesser frequency noise, uh, the coherence length increases. Uh, in, the case of in the case of LIGO, we successively reduce the laser frequency line width. 
but also the the fundamental uh, uh, process in which the LIGO laser generates its laser line, which comes from a single cavity uh, called a non-planar ring or isol non-planar ring isolator and probe. That cavity is a very stable cavity which has very low vibration. So it's able to produce a very narrow line width, which has a very long coherence length. Uh, the typical cohere, the typical line widths in uh, LIGO are uh, uh, less than a uh, kilohertz to begin with, and uh, we then bring it down to subhertz. Oh, um, okay. So Padmaraj Kore. Uh, Gravitational waves cause distortion in space and elongate the length in our outcome. What about time? Does gravitational wave distort space as well as time? Yes, the gravitational waves do uh, affect clocks. However, uh, observing the uh, rate of change of a clock frequency is much, much harder than observing the uh, distance fluctuations. That's the reason why we opt to do it this way. However, there is a, a, a global research community which does what we call pulsar timing. Uh, the timing of distant pulsars when a gravitational wave passes by, there is a fluctuation in the observed or the received clock signal that you get from that pulsar. And by observing these clock changes, you can actually infer what is the gravitational wave frequency and amplitude that is passing by. Uh, and this is a very low frequency sensitivity instrument. And uh, we hope to uh, detect uh, very low frequency gravitational waves uh, using pulsar arrays, uh, sorry, pulsar timing arrays. Shibangi Majumdar asks, uh, why do the two beams have to be perpendicular? Well, in principle, they don't have to be perpendicular. They just don't have to be in the same direction. Uh, yeah, it just, uh, see, uh, since the gravitational waves are quadrupolar in nature, that means they are naturally, uh, uh, the contraction and expansion directions are orthogonal to each other. So the maximum signal will be obtained when you have this, the two arms perpendicular to each other. Rupam Kundu. Sir, if uh, the distance between the mirrors can change, then why does the distance between the splitter and the detector not change? Well, in principle, it does. However, the distance between the splitter and the detector uh, does not change by much because that distance is very small. It's only a few tens of meters. And also, the detector is not suspended. It's fixed to the ground. And uh, even if it were to change, it does not cause any signal because in the detector pathway, it's in the dark port. And the two beams have already finished interfering with each other. And they have produced uh, either a null or a either dark fringe or a bright fringe. So it doesn't affect your detection signal, even if that length were to fluctuate. Uh, Devolina Chatterjee. So why Michelson in, Michelson's interferometer is used and not any other kind of interferometer? Um, I suppose other kinds of interferometers could be used, but they would not be, I think, as sensitive to a relative distance because you're comparing the arm lengths in two different directions. Uh, not, for example, a total round trip time as in a Sanyak detector. Uh, so the Michelson detector geometry is optimized for detecting the differential change in two different directions. Uh, that's the reason why we use a Michelson detector. Parth Bhagavad, what is the purpose of CP in the interferometer arms? Ah, CP is the compensation plate. The compensation plate is used to 
correct for the refractive index changes that occur in the mirrors due to the thermal effects. So the thermal effects cause a kind of a lens in the interferometer and the compensation plate kind of corrects for that lens by putting an opposite lens. Ayushi Chippa asks, uh, how can we decide which frequency band contains the signal? Well, actually, gravitational waves occur in a very wide range of frequencies. Uh, our choice of the detection band is not based on uh, the nature of the gravitational waves completely. It actually is based more on what is the practical uh, frequency band in which we can obtain low signal, low, no, low noise. Also, we kind of know, given a certain range of masses of uh, stellar objects, like uh, black holes and neutron stars, uh, we had in mind, uh, from astrophysical reasons, we had a certain range of masses for the, uh, for the neutron stars, for example, a few solar masses. Uh, given such an object, we had a fair idea of what will be the in spiral frequency, what will be the pre-merger frequency. So we targeted our detector in this uh, few hundred hertz kind of a detection range uh, because we expect, uh, uh, well, neutron stars we know are about uh, two kilohertz, uh, around about two kilohertz. Uh, and uh, merging black holes would be a few hundred hertz. So that was the range in which uh, we targeted our detection because that's where we expect a typical source to arise. However, there are also sources at much lower frequencies coming from primordial black holes, from uh, you know Big Bang and so on. So those frequencies are not amenable to a ground-based LIGO-like detector, but uh, they are available. That those signals will be more efficiently detected in a space-based detector like LISA or a, a pulsar timing array or, uh, or the BICEP experiment, which is looking at the uh, polarization of uh, uh, 3 millikelvin uh, background radiation. Uh, so there are multiple ways to detect gravitational waves at different frequency bands. So Harsh Mehta asks, how does the SRM work? Well, uh, the SRM is a signal recycling mirror, and that is also a suspended mirror in the dark port. Uh, now, if the, uh, if the length of the signal recycling cavity is adjusted so that it is not resonant on the, uh, on the, main laser light, but it is detuned by a sub small amount mm -hmm. such that uh, the frequencies which are enhanced are not close to zero, but uh, in the 100 hertz to a kilohertz band, then it tends to uh, enhance those signals and extract those signals preferentially from the detector. Uh, it has a, it is a detect, it's a mirror which has a, a reflectivity of about uh, 14% or 10% uh, or so. And it, uh, it, it cheaply works as a, a signal extraction. And it also increases the bandwidth of the detector. So without a signal recycling mirror, the advanced LIGO detector would have a narrower band of sensitivity, more sensitivity, but uh, less. Uh, uh, it'll have more sensitivity in a narrow region, but uh, not uh, a very broad band. I can, well, I can show you, I think, a particular plot that I had, which shows how the uh, sensitivity of the detectors changes as you change the, uh, change the interferometer configuration. Is, as you see, the Michelson interferometer has an extremely broad range. There is a topmost red curve, the simple Michelson, but its sensitivity is very poor. Once you have a Michelson with the Fabry-Ferro arms, you get the brown curve. And the brown curve has uh, 
uh, fairly, it has increased the uh, detection significantly. And it, however, it's uh, uh, the, the range of uh, sensitive uh, band has decreased. Uh, then once, and you have a reasonably high noise in uh, high short noise uh, in the high frequencies. And the only way you can bring down short noise, well, the most classical way is to increase the amount of power in the arms. And so we introduce the power recycling cavity and the power in the interferometer increases sharply. And so we get a much higher detection, much lower noise at high frequencies because the power in the interferometer has gone up. However, you can see that this yarn curve here as a fairly, uh, it's fairly narrow, and it's uh, if you say uh, if you compare 10 to the minus 23 and below, its uh, detection range is uh, maybe a few tens of hertz to a few hundred hertz. But the introduction of the signal recycling cavity uh, in advanced LIGO has significantly broadened the sensitivity of the detector, which now goes from a few tens of hertz to a few kilohertz. So that is a significant change uh, by introducing the signal recycling cavity and uh, tuning the detuning the signal recycling cavity such that we are able to concentrate on a certain portion of the frequency band kamal tej has uh, asked uh, will the speed of rotation of the earth and the solar system affect ligo if yes how if no why uh, the speed of detection of the Earth it may affect in terms of a constant force because uh, there is very little. Um, the we know that the rotation speed of the Earth is not constant. There are rotations and and uh, um, precession of the Earth uh, poles and so on. Uh, however, uh, those are very low frequency effects. At 100 hertz or and above, we don't expect those changes to be a significant contributor to noise. Uh, so there is, however, a, a, an effect coming from the moon due to the tidal force of the moon. Uh, the tidal forces cause the mirrors to move. And uh, we do apply a tidal correction in order to hold the mirrors uh, at a required position. Uh, without doing the tidal correction, we won't be able to operate the interferometer. Uh, Chinmay asks, uh, after the wave passes, is it possible that the local space doesn't come back to its original shape or arrangement because of the distortion caused by the wave? How to observe this? Well, uh, as you know, uh, waves are something that causes uh, uh, momentary fluctuations. And after the wave has passed, the distortion of the wave caused by the wave is gone away because the space is perfectly elastic. It doesn't have any plasticity. So uh, the distortion caused by the wave is not permanent. Krishna asks, uh, oh, Krishna, Rohit, and Siddharth ask, uh, what is Newtonian noise? What comes under Newtonian noise, and why is it so difficult to reduce it? Well, Newtonian noise is, uh, the answer is there in the question itself. Newtonian noise is caused by a force which is similar to Newtonian force of gravity. That is Newton's law, which is uh, any two masses which are uh, separated by a distance r will have m1, m2 over r square kind of a force. And that uh, is a kind of force which uh, any nearby object can exert upon the suspended mirror. Now, as it happens, even a change in the density of material in the vicinity of the mirror can act like a momentary uh, uh, Newtonian force, which is a reason because of a slight, a slightly higher density on one side. Now that density fluctuation can arise because of many reasons. Chief among them is seismic activity. Seismic activity are waves, they are pressure waves through the Earth, and so they cause density fluctuations in the material of the Earth near the detector. 
and that can cause the uh, a Newtonian force to arise, which will pull the mirror. Of course, uh, seismic activity is a broadband activity. It happens at many frequencies. So in the frequency band of the detector, if there are fluctuations of the density in the vicinity of the mirrors, it can cause Newtonian pull, which shakes the mirrors. And that is Newtonian noise. And since uh, it is impossible to shield gravity, unlike electromagnetic fields, you cannot put a shielding agent of any kind. Gravity passes through all materials. So there is no way to protect yourself from, uh, uh, from seismically induced uh, Newtonian noise. Uh, there are, however, efforts to try and see how we can, uh, how we can attack this problem. Right now, uh, advanced LIGO detector sensitivity is not uh, reached the lane, reached the level where you have to worry about Newtonian noise. But we may hit it in the future detectors, and so we have started thinking about what to do uh, for the future detectors which will operate at higher sensitivities. Uh, Krishna has asked us. Uh, why only black hole merger or neutron star merger produce gravitational waves? Well, uh, the simple reason is that the mass density of these objects is much, much higher. Everybody produces gravitational waves. You and I also produce gravitational waves, but uh, the amplitude is too small to detect. In order for the gravitational wave to be strong enough for us to detect and strong enough for it to uh, propagate uh, very long distances because as the wave propagates, uh, its intensity will drop linearly with distance. Uh, not intensity, its amplitude will drop linearly with distance. Uh, so uh, it's hard to detect objects which are much smaller and much less dense than a neutron star or a black hole. That's the reason why we talk about these particular sources. But in principle, yes, uh, even a binary star system would generate gravitational waves but much, much smaller in magnitude. Waiting for the next question. Priyanka Roy Chaudhary. Sir, will the mirrors in the LIGO India detector use adaptive optics mechanism? Uh, we do have adaptive optics, which we plan to install soon, but not in the same way that, uh, uh, that is used in astronomy. Uh, I'm just replying to our uh, talk managers. Uh, so, for example, uh, in the case of astronomy, you have air between uh, the stars and us, and we need to compensate for the refractive index fluctuations of the air. So we do adaptive optics. In the case of LIGO, typically, well, LIGO instrument is inside vacuum, inside a very large vacuum chamber. So there are no refractive index fluctuations due to air. But we do have problems coming from thermal, thermal effects. Uh, the optics uh, gradually absorb some heat and uh, they change shape. And uh, we need to correct either the shape of the optic that has bent or you have to put in a compensation plate and uh, those are the uh, places where we apply some kind of a corrective action and uh, it is similar to an adaptive optics but it is much much slower we do it uh, over hours of time scales rather than milliseconds
Okay, Abhinav Patra has asked, how will introduction of LIGO India improve observations of gravitational waves? Nice question. So, as I said, uh, gravitational wave detectors are like radio antenna. And uh, just like a radio antenna works, a single radio antenna can tell you roughly where the source is and the nature of the source. But for us to be able to do a, an electromagnetic follow-up, which means uh, what uh, uh, Varun Palerao spoke about on Friday, uh, if you want to follow up the detection of a gravitational wave source by turning an optical telescope or a X-ray telescope in that direction and trying to figure out what is the nature of that source in all the other frequency bands, we need a very precise location for that source. And that can only be obtained if you combine the signals from multiple detectors and use a typical triangulation algorithm and uh, try to, so for a triangulation algorithm to work very well, you need a long baseline, uh, like in all uh, radio telescopes. So the larger the telescope you get, the more precise is the location you can get. And uh, multiple such detectors will give rise to a very precise location because sometimes uh, the source is, uh, the gravitation wave detectors also have some blind spots. Uh, in certain directions, if the signal, if the source is in certain directions with respect to the detector, it will be invisible to the detector. So, uh, in order to fill all the blind spots and to be able to provide long baselines and to create an array of detectors, uh, that's how we manage to localize the sources and give that information to other telescopes. In that sense, India provides the longest baselines compared to all the existing telescope in the existing gravitational wave observatories. That is the real value of India. In addition to allowing us to, you know, com combining signals from multiple detectors also allows us to detect things like, are the black holes spinning? Are they uh, co-aligned? Are they anti-aligned? Are they uh, precessing? All these other finer aspects of what is happening in the merger can only be detected with higher and higher sensitivities and also being able to detect multiple polarizations. You might recall in the very second video that I showed, in different directions, the nature of stretching and compression of space is different. In order to get the full information, you need to have detectors. It's like, polar, like a polarization analogously to the electromagnetic wave you in order there are two polarizations in electromagnetic waves so also in gravitational waves there are two polarizations uh, in the case of the electromagnetic waves we call it like vertical and horizontal polarizations uh, in the case of uh, gravitational waves we call them plus polarization and cross polarizations now having multiple detectors allows you to sense multiple polarizations and derive a very clean signal from a clean reconstruction of the source. So both in terms of localization, as well as detecting the multiple polarization states of the source, we need LIGO India. Shraddha Mohanani has asked, in what manner the gravitational waves propagating in a direct direction perpendicular to the detector will affect the interference pattern? So the detector occupies a certain plane and a gravitational wave propagating perpendicular to the plane of the detector is exactly what I showed you in my very first simulation. So let me go back here. So this particular uh, action in which you see the mirrors moving back and forth, that's exactly what the gravitational wave does. Ishita asks, if a gravitational wave stretches the distance between LIGO mirrors, does it also stretch the wavelength of laser light? Well, in principle, yes, but in practice, no. The reason is that uh, the laser light bounces back and forth between the mirrors and exits the interferometer much faster than the time 
the mirrors have to move. So it's like you have one pulse of light which senses a certain distance, then the gravi- and then the gravitational move, the gravitational wave moves the mirrors, and the next pulse of light senses the the uh, the changed length of the interferometer. So successive pulses of light are detecting successive distances between the mirrors. That's the reason, uh, and we are kind of accumulating all that signal in time. So uh, it's like we are sensing the motion of the detector instantaneously every time the mirror moves. Yeah, so I would like to also uh, tell you about uh, uh, Professor uh, Shomak Rai Chaudhary's talk uh, coming up on 8th of April. It's on observing black holes. And uh, I think uh, you would have much to say about uh, the various ways in which uh, black holes are uh, uh, probed for uh, the fundamental physics, as well as what they will reveal in terms of uh, astrophysics and uh, uh, the evolution of the universe. So it should be a very interesting talk. I encourage you all to come back and attend that. It's again on uh, 4 to 5 p.m. on the 8th of April. Thank you, and I hope uh, we'll hear more. We'll hear more from you in the future.